Welcome to For Fox Sake, where we give zero fucks about money shame and talk about real life and finance, including the taboo behind it all. So grab your Monday morning caffeine and let's chat. Good morning, Fox Den. Thank you for joining me this Monday. I am so excited today to talk about the Olympics. As most of my listeners know, I am very into the Olympics. I'm more into the Winter Olympics than I am the Summer Olympics, but I was a gymnast for 13 years, so I do love Simone Biles. Um, And I was super excited to watch her just make history because I knew that she was going to sweep Paris after her Tokyo uh, Olympics. So I also thought it would be really cool in thinking about how much I do love this event to talk about the financials behind it and the politics behind it, because the Olympics is one of those events in our culture and our society that is extremely political and has financial ramifications for the host countries and for several other countries. So I just wanted to do something a little more current events wise, and that's why we're talking about it. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the cost to host um, for the cities and countries. So Beijing hosted 2022 Winter Games after Oslo, Stockholm, Munich, and Krakow all withdrew their bids. Um, And the 1976 Montreal Summer Games went so over budget that they didn't finish paying off the $1.5 billion Canadian dollars until 2006. The mayor of Montreal at the time, Jean Drapeau, said that the Olympics would be self-financed and would not incur debt by saying the Montreal Olympics can no more have a deficit than a man can have a baby, which obviously is wrong on both counts. (laughs) Um, So those other uh, cities that dropped out withdrew because of the crazy financial burden that these games put on the cities. The roof of the stadium, nicknamed the Big O, has been replaced twice already, and Quebec announced this year it will be spending another $870 million to replace it a third time. So just to build the Olympic Village, to build the venues, to host so many tourists and staff and athletes, um, and just building all of that up takes millions and billions of dollars. And it is likely that these countries and these cities actually don't see any benefit financially from hosting the games. L.A. in 1984 is the only time a profit has been made by a city. It's the only city to bid for the 1984 Summer Games, so it was able to negotiate better than usual terms with the IOC. And it also used mostly existing infrastructure, kind of like we're seeing today with Paris. The Athens 2004 games and the debt incurred contributed to the Greek economic collapse and even bidding cost millions of dollars. Tokyo spent $150 million on a failed 2016 bid and Toronto decided not to bother with a bid for the 2024 games that was estimated to cost $60 million. Infrastructure costs are a large part of the expense. The IOC requires host cities to have 40K available hotel rooms minimum. And new venues frequently built and then ignored, like the derelict Athens buildings and the Bird's Nest Stadium in Beijing that was mostly neglected until the Winter Games came back to the city. Pre-bid studies usually claim there will be boosts to host city countries, but these usually don't pan out like we just talked about. (laughs) Post-game studies of Salt Lake 2002 Winter Games found a short-term 7K job increase, one-tenth the increase promised before the Games, but no long-term increase. Sometimes the games do lead to an increase in tourism. Barcelona went from 11th to 6th most popular destination city in Europe after the 1992 games, but Beijing, London, and Salt Lake City all saw decreases in the years they hosted. And this was likely because the games increased costs of hotels, travel, crowding near venues, increased security, etc., etc. All this to say, hosting the games is more of a financial flex than it is a financial accent to any country or city hosting these games. In addition to costing a bunch of money, there is a general lack of support for Olympic athletes. Olympians aren't paid by the IOC. 
athletes are mostly dependent on national Olympic committees and their sports international federations for pay. U.S. athletes depend on mostly sponsorships and endorsements. Some get grants and scholarships once selected for Team USA, but it's not guaranteed. And it's, there's even less funding before selection. U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee pay bonuses for meddling, but not for competing. So if you get gold, you get 37500 If you get silver, you get 22500 And if you get bronze, you get $15,000. France is paying 80K euros for gold, which is 86,500, and Spain is paying roughly $102,000. A quote from Maggie Steffens, captain of the U.S. women's water polo team. Some may not know this, but most Olympians need a second or third job to support chasing the dream, myself included. And most teams rely on sponsors for travel, accommodations, nutritional support, rent and lodging, and simply affording to live in this day and age, especially female sports and female athletes. After that post was made, Flava Flav began providing an undisclosed amount of funding to the U.S. women's polo team in a five-year deal, which is one of my favorite things ever. <laughs> and you might notice that there is a Stifle U.S. Alpine free ski freestyle ski team. That is the name of a company before the United States because that company is sponsoring that team. If you watch any kind of Olympic sports movie, this is not unfamiliar to you. I mean, even in Cool Runnings, there were funding issues. Margot Robbie played in I, Tonya as Tonya Harding, and there were funding issues in that. And they showed her working multiple jobs or volunteering by um, teaching younger children at the rink so that she could get in some skate time. This is something that is well known, but nothing ever really seems to be done about it. And even in other countries, Olympians are treated like military. They're subsidized by the government because it is a point of pride for countries. So it's very interesting how different cultures and different countries put value for athletes and take care of them. And speaking of different cultures and different countries, like I told you in the beginning, the Olympics is heavily political. And that is because countries coming together is a political thing. <laughs> there have been Definitely some interesting choices made by the IOC, for instance, letting Russia host the 2014 Winter Sochi Olympics and they invaded Ukraine three days after the closing ceremony. And then they decided to not let them compete this year, but they let Israel compete this year, despite the genocide in Palestine. And we also have interesting decisions with North and South Korea, China's human rights issues, etc. And I think the last thing that we can talk about, and I think uh, people that <laughs> watch the Olympics can all agree on, is that NBC fucking sucks with their coverage of the Olympics. They omit parts of the opening and closing ceremonies. They don't even air some events. The commentary this year with Kelly Clarkson. Listen, I, I love Kelly Clarkson. I do. And I love Peyton Manning. But why would I want to watch two people that have absolutely no stake in the Olympics talk about the opening ceremonies? The, the most entertaining thing about Kelly Clarkson this year was just how excited she was to be watching the ceremonies, but she didn't have anything of value to add and neither did Peyton Manning, really. And there is also tape delays, making some events just completely unwatchable until much later and then spoiling the results in their other programming before the event is even shown. And just, you know, obviously I find out everything through social media before I even watch the events, which kind of makes it not as fun. Things that they can do better. Harris tried to avoid building any new venues, either they used existing infrastructure or they built temporary locations to cut down on the future maintenance expenses, which I thought was great. Sometimes the infrastructure spending was desperately needed and was only spent because of the Olympics. Otherwise, the city would have continued to be neglected by the government. I also thought <laughs> the uh, cleaning up the Seine River was uh, a bit dubious. Uh, I saw a picture of an Olympic athlete throwing up after swimming in the Seine. So the Olympics is just that this thing that is nostalgic for me because I, I grew up watching the Olympics. I grew up watching these documentaries and these shows and these movies. Um, I think it's something that at the surface level, it is so lovely that all countries can come together and there can be unity and peace within this event. 
But that is not to say that there is not monetary consequences, political ramifications, decisions that are made that are politically motivated and things like that. You know, I mean, just to compete for being a host city, you have to be a wealthier country. And that within and of itself is political. So I just thought it would be really interesting to talk about this because not everybody knows about, you know, the athletes not being able to be funded. Not everybody knows about the politics behind hosting the Olympics. Not everybody knows that NBC omits parts of things. But now you do. And if you didn't, I hope you just you learned something new today. So let me know what your favorite Olympic sport is in the Summer Olympics. I know for me, it's obviously gymnastics, but I also love track and field. It's fantastic. Salt Lake City is hosting with the Winter Olympics in 2034. <laughs> so hopefully if we make it till then, Joe and I, we are going to be going to the Olympics. Uh, that is something that we desperately want to do together. It's probably the only time that I will ever wear American apparel, the USA, go all out with my patriotism. I want to see hockey. I want to see figure skating. I am going to go crazy in the curling venue. Like we are just, we're fiends for the Winter Olympics. Uh, so that is something to look forward to in a decade. <laughs> All right, y'all. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. I hope America wins all the gold and uh, we'll see you next week. Toodaloo. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of For Fox Sake. If you want more content like this, follow me on Instagram, TikTok, and threads at vfrugalfox. And don't be a stranger. I respond to followers and love feedback from my community. If you want to make my day and help this podcast reach more people, please consider giving a review wherever you listen to your podcast. A special thanks to Kaylee Johnson, Heather Devoki, and Joseph Bogomel. See you next week. And remember, do it with an open heart and no attachment to the result.